First of all, I forgot to give praise to God because he was with me through the whole thing. And then I heard a preacher on the radio. And he said that God dwells in the darkness. And that's something I never heard. Dwells where? In the darkness. Oh, yeah. Yeah. God is light, oh, yeah. but he dwells in the darkness. Mm -hmm. right? And so that is why I was able to stand here today, because my husband said he was afraid that I was going to stop breathing. So I kept acting like I was going to stop breathing. And God was telling him just to tell her to breathe, just tell her to breathe. And here, and Exodus 20, it speaks of God dwelling in this darkness. When Moses went up on Mount Sinai, in Exodus 20, 21, the people were so afraid because God was big and loud and, and bigger than the mountain because he was up on the mountain and talking to them from the mountain and it scared them. And they said, don't have God talk to us anymore because if we might die. And so Moses, he said, they said, you talk to us. You talk to God, and then you talk to us. And we'll do whatever God says, they said. But here in verse 21, it says, the people remained at a distance while Moses approached the thick darkness where God was. And so another thing that you can use this scripture for, I thought of, was with children who maybe are afraid of the dark and tell them that God is always with you because he dwells in the darkness. Amen. Amen. God is in the morning. God is in the evening. You got anything you want to say about the conference, Father? Well, we didn't want to. You didn't want me to preach? Well, if you want to, we can. <laughs> so this was the first conference. I still have my keyboard glasses on. This was the first conference of three years because of the pandemic. And uh, and then, of course, Jim got so sick last week that he couldn't, he and Ramona couldn't be there. Um, but Susie and Craig, his daughter and son-in-law, did an amazing job. They took over and um, hosted the conference. Um, Susie is so much like her mom, I think. She sounds like her. And she took her dad's place in front of the, the camera um, when it started live streaming and explained everything that was going on with her parents. And uh, it, it was really good. They had. I, I think that if you ever get discouraged because you don't think the young people are going to carry on the work of the Lord, because it looks like they're all doing something else, don't get discouraged because we listened to four young men, three actually, and then I listened to Jonathan Miller live streaming on Saturday morning. And, and they're amazing ministries and amazing work that they're doing. The young man Christoph, Chris um, Mickelson from Minnesota got saved in 2008. He and his wife, he was a drug dealer and doing drugs and everything crazy. And he is now preaching to millions of people and getting millions of salvations in Pakistan of all places one of the most dangerous places on earth, and seeing multiple miracles. And yet he's a hometown boy from Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And so they're just young. They just started in the ministry. And there's people like Chris all over. And the other three young men um, have been at it for longer, but they're young. <laughs> Compared to us, they're really young. And, right? And they have got all the passion for the Lord, and they're out there every day, and they are also going overseas and working here in this country. Jonathan is a pastor of a large church in Orlando, Florida, 
And, uh, and so it, 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 it encouraged my heart. It encouraged my heart that, that we have left a legacy uh, they have inherited and they are moving on top. You know, Francis Hunter always said that the people she was ministering to were walking on the ceiling, on their ceiling. And now we have people that we have discipled that are walking on our ceiling and that includes this next generation now. And things are stronger and stronger as they must be because we are getting closer and closer to the time when Jesus is coming back. And so that impacted me. There was a lot of prayer going on. The conference had changed quite a bit. Um, there were just those four people who were doing speaking. There was no workshops like we have done for years, things like that. You want the mic back, don't you? What if I don't want to give it back? <laughs> was that, uh, was that Jonathan, was Things that are changing. What? That Jonathan Miller, was that and his Jonathan? No, no, but I saw it in the book and I said, oh, we, so we helped us. raise up that little squirt, Jonathan Miller, but no, he wasn't. He is in the ministry. Yes, I know that. But he's not in Orlando, Florida. This guy was and he didn't look like this guy. <laughs> he was from Osaka. Minnesota. Oh, that was Chris. That was Chris. Yeah. Okay. Just a little town, about the size of their pen. It's just white. Oh, it didn't get washed away. <laughs> no, it didn't get washed away. But you know, of course, I love worship, and Jim and Ramona's granddaughter, Lauren. Um, again, she has put together an amazing team. There was a new gentleman from Texas that this is all he does is travel around and help the worship team in different conferences, conferences and, and churches and things. She, the worship was over the top, over the top. So anointed and so personal for each one of us. So we could just really connect with the Lord. Yeah. So that's my take, Pastor. Hallelujah. It was good. It was good. Uh, I don't know. I prayed for a lot of people. It was kind of exciting because my highlight was I didn't have to teach. So I I held court in the Narthex by the hour, prayed for people and talked to people. I hadn't had that opportunity for a long time. And I met a lot of people that I had prayed for years ago, and they came and shared their testimony. So that was that was cool. You know, and I don't know if I want to put this on the tape, but I got a couple of points here that I just want to make. How flat, how flat do you have to get on your back before you look up? Now think about that, because this is important. The when we started the the conference, the first the first speaker, God gave me a word, a vision, a combination of both, and here's what it is. He said he's going to move in power in a way that we have never seen before. But he said there's an awful lot of people that are living with old wine skins. And they refuse to let go of the old wineskins and embrace new wineskins. He said, you need to embrace the new wineskins. Forget about the old skins. And then he went on to say that you need to embrace the power that's going to come from the Holy Spirit and from the Godhead, from the kingdom. And then it was over. We have to quit embracing old wineskins. We have to start embracing the new. We're not talking about new scripture. We're not talking about new interpretations. We're not talking about any of that. We're simply talking about a new revelation of the power of God. And that's a confirmation to me because in the African thing and also in, 
in central Wisconsin here to speak with and working with. We're talking about redeeming the land. And I'm going to talk about that next week. But when you redeem the land, you literally have communion with the land. Jesus was made a curse for us. And the curse for us was not only not only our physical curse, but it was a spiritual curse. And it cursed the land. And creation is waiting for the sons of God to manifest themselves. We need to grab a hold of that. Why did I mention we had five different, four different races and these different churches? You know what? We didn't have an argument. We didn't have an argument. You mean somebody didn't tell you how to pick apples? Huh? Somebody didn't show you how to pick apples or you were telling them you were picking them wrong? Yeah. Well, Rex did. Yeah, we didn't have an argument. No, we Rex all, showed us how We picked did. apples and we all fellowshiped with each other. We had one banner. That was Jesus Christ. One race of people. One theology. That's kind of exciting. That's kind of exciting. And they say that people can't do it. How far do we have to get? How, how far down does our country have to go before we will look up and quit these stupid things? These stupid ideologies. I'm a Lutheran. I'm a Baptist. I'm a this. I'm a that. Think about that. We have one race, one people, one theology. And we have lots of colors. Here we have maroon. Here we have another maroon. Here we have black. Here we have white. Here we have blue. Here we have gray. <laughs> no, that was not necessary. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, okay, that, and we need to strive for that, folks. We really need to strive for that because that is what is going to. That's new theology. That new theology. That's new money. We will. Cooperate with each other, or the boat will go down. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make any difference if you're an atheist, a pagan, or a Christian. When you set fire to the boat, you're going to go down with it. Mm -hmm. How flat do we have to get before we look up? That was the second part of that. And that was the question that the Holy Spirit had brought. That came so loud and clear, it wasn't, <coughs> we weren't in the meeting five minutes and God is talking to me and that's what he was telling me. Well, I got a couple notes for our audience and then we'll go on. Uh, yep. go. go ahead. Okay, praise God. Welcome to Reaching Out. We've got an exciting program lined up for you today. We're going to talk about joy and freedom in the Word of God. You can rejoice in the goodness of the Lord, or you can slobber in the misery of the devil. How many of us love misery? How many of us love misery? Ask yourself that question. The next time you go down to the bar, the next time you lie about somebody, the next time you say something you shouldn't say, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, and he will do it any way he can. Yeah. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what you do or don't think. He doesn't care what religion you are or are not. You are one race, one people, and one religion, and that religion is Jesus Christ. We may not all understand it exactly the same way, but you know what? There is no change. So when we look at it from that perspective, we can slobber in misery and cause trouble for each other all our life, and the devil will sit back and he just laugh at you. So we send terrorists over here, and we send an army over there, and we send liars over here, and we send some heathen over there, but you know what? We're all going down because it's destroying our country. Look at what's happening in the Ukraine. How stupid. Man, that's too kind of work. How much of a fool do we, no, that's too kind of a work. 
it's absolutely ludicrous that you would have a leader of a country shooting hospitals, schools, and apartment buildings. That's completely and totally uncalled for. But that's what's going on because the devil has got a piece of his height. The devil has said, well, you've got to kill him. I don't care if you agree with them or don't agree with them. Don't make any difference. You don't just go around killing people just for the sake of killing them. When will we learn to look for the common good in our relationships with each other? Do you know what's the difference between the suffering of a Muslim in one of these countries or the suffering of a Christian if they don't have any food? The suffering is the same. They're going to starve to death. Yeah. At the hands of somebody that thinks he is better than. That's the devil's tactic. And the devil will do it and he will use it. Joy and freedom is not a season. It's a style of living. We need to rejoice in everything. It doesn't make any difference what we do. We need to rejoice and be happy. Jesus came to give us life and life more abundantly. You know, he let the sun shine on the non-believer. He let the sun shine on the believer. He let the sun shine on all the animals, all the plants. And we need to rejoice in that. Because that is what God has provided us with. And that is what God has provided you with. We need to rejoice and give him glory in everything. And the faster we can clean up our act, the more power and the more peace we're going to come. We're going to run in, in our own countries, in our own places. You know, in, in 1 Chronicles 16, 27, it says, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are his dwelling place. We need to be happy. We need to be happy when we see the birds sing. We need to be happy when we see things grow. We need to be happy when we can help somebody. You know, if you want to really have a good, you, you want to really have a good lift, just simply help somebody do something. Just simply help them. It will change your attitude. It will change your atmosphere. It will change everything around you because you will be happy. They will be happy and everybody around, around you will be happy. Don't put yourself in a position to be unhappy. One easy way to feel miserable is to allow your joy to come from your performance. Oh boy, I'm this, I did this. You know what, I beat somebody in a game of checkers. Big deal. What's gonna happen when, you have, when somebody else plays a game of checkers and you lose? Now you lost your joy? No. The joy should be in playing the game. The joy should be in interacting with the other person. The joy should be in the conversation and the fellowship. When are we going to get over our egotistical selfishness that we so, so diligently try to protect? The blood of Christ is what has given us the freedom. The blood of Christ has given us the freedom. Jesus Christ came that we would have life and life more abundantly. And if we can embrace the blood of Christ, I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about politics. I'm not talking about denominations. I'm talking about the simple blood of Christ. You are a part of God's creation. You are a caretaker of God's creation. And that power that you walk in comes from the Lord. That joy that you got walking comes from the Lord. That everything that you have will come from the Lord. Your joy doesn't lie in your identity. Your joy doesn't lie in your identity. Your joy lies in your relationship. The joy lies in your relationship. Yes, you know, you can be identified any way you want to, but there's no joy in that. The joy is in your relationship with everyone around you. Well, look at me, I've got a million bucks. Yeah, so what? Well, look at me, I've got a Cadillac. So what? Look at me, I, I'm this, I'm that. No, 
Your joy comes from your relationship for the people around you. The joy comes from that relationship. Here's a question that we should all look at real seriously. Where do you seek to get joy? Where do you go to find joy? Where do you go to find joy? Is it the beer bottle? Is it the drug bottle? Is it the ego trip? I'm better than you. Is it the money? Oh, I got more. Is your ability to sing? Is your ability to tell more stories than the other person? Is the ability to gossip more? Where do you seek joy? Where do you look for the joy when you want to feel good? Think about that for just a second. We all have our safe place, our uh, sweet place, our honey place. We have many terms for it. If you want to be happy, where do you go? Wanda, where do you go when you want to be happy? Where do I go? To my Bible. She says go to the Word of God. Where do you go if you want to be happy? Mm -hmm. oh Dirty magazine? Oh Fashion. Shopping. Amen. Where do you go to find joy? Why don't we find the joy in Christ? Because our heart is someplace else. Our heart is someplace else. We don't find joy in Christ because we've got our thoughts over here. Well, you could get in trouble with everybody in the world with this statement. But some of us find joy in our intelligence, our degrees. Some of us will find joy in our finances. Mm -hmm. Some of us will find joy in our food. Some will find joy in gossip. Take an, take an analysis of your own situation and see where you will find joy. In 1 Corinthians 10.23 it says, All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. If I was giving this as a class, I'd have everybody take a sheet of paper out and write down the last 10 things they did today that was helpful to them. And then I'd have them write another sheet of paper write down all the things that were not helpful to them. Helpful to them. I got up. That's helpful. Not helpful. I didn't feel like getting up so I got cranky. <laughs> not helpful. I got up felt bad. Not helpful. Then I went and instead of eating two eggs, I ate three or four. <laughs> An extra piece of toast. I got up and says, praise God, it's morning, I'm happy, hallelujah, glory, glory, glory. It's helpful. <laughs> Scary. Scary? No, it's very helpful. <laughs> we, need to, we need to figure out who we are, because we need to manage ourselves. We need to manage our life. We need to manage who we are. Mm -hmm. Most people have an opinion of who they are, but their actions are something else. Let me say that again. Most people have an opinion of who and what they are, but their actions are way over here. Where do you go to find your joy? Where do you go to find your safe place? I can tell you where I go. I love to go out in the woods 
and sit and listen to the birds. That's a cool place to be. That's a cool place to be. Hebrews 12, 2 to 3. I'm going to, I want to share that first and then I'm going to close this. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endures the cross, scorning its shame, set down on the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you would not grow weary and lose heart. When you go to bed at night, you should do one thing, two things, maybe, maybe three things. Lord, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, you're so good to me. Jesus, give me, give me eight hours of sleep. Jesus, give me rest. Jesus, let me sleep in peace. Jesus, touch my heart and give me revelation. Jesus, give me sweet dreams. So what do we do when we go to bed? I wonder what he said about me. I think he said something he wasn't supposed to. I wonder what she thinks of me. I wonder what those people did in a Bible study. They did not think they were lying to me. What do you think about when you go to bed? Do you think about Jesus or do you slobber in the pool of the devil? Let me read this again. You can rejoice in the goodness of the Lord or slobber in the misery of the devil. If you go to bed at night and you're not walking with Jesus and praising him and loving him and touching him and reaching out to him, you're missing it. Absolutely missing it. If you think, oh, I think I might get cancer. I might get COVID. I might get this. I might get that. That's the tool of the devil. By 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not even ready to go to sleep. <laughs> when, you, when you need to go and lay down, you shut your eyes. Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I just love you. You've been so good to me. You've blessed me. You've blessed us with apples today. You've blessed the people in the church. You've blessed my finances. I've had plenty to eat. I've had... You just tell him how much he's blessed you. Just walk close to his heart. Develop an intimacy with him. And you won't have any problem going to sleep. You won't have any problem reaching out and touching him. But slob around in the misery of the devil and you will have no sleep. You will have no peace and you will have no, no understanding. There is only one religion and that one religion is Jesus Christ. There is only one problem in the world. Not enough Jesus. I don't care what people will tell you <clears throat> because a lot of times they will have many reasons why they don't have enough Jesus. But I'll tell you the biggest reason they don't have enough Jesus is because they don't want him. They want to slobber in the misery of the devil. They want to slobber in the misery of the devil. And there's where we need to cut the lines. We don't need to do that. We need to rejoice in people. We need to rejoice in what we're doing. We need to rejoice in what God has done for us. It doesn't make any difference. Anything else, nothing else makes any difference. Only thing that makes a difference is Jesus Christ. He says we should do his work. We should be imitators. What did he do? He went about the, about the world healing people, restoring people, and making them whole. To bring peace and comfort to the hurting. I want to pray for everybody as we close this broadcast. Father, we just ask you right now, I just ask you to touch those people that need healing. If you're there and you need healing in your body, I want you to just, just focus on that part of your body. Put your hand on that part of your body. Father, you see the, in the hearts of these people. We ask for a complete miracle in their bodies. We command all cancer to be gone. We command all 
scoliosis to be gone, scoliosis, go, you leave those people completely and totally. All your symptoms of COVID, you go. All cancer cells, you go. Satan, you have no authority in the lives of these people. They're gonna walk in the power that the Holy Spirit has released to them. They're gonna walk in new wineskins. They're gonna walk free of the old wineskin, the old tradition that we have so long uh, wallowed around in. They're gonna embrace the new wineskin. They're gonna pray for each other. They're gonna hold each other up. And Father, we thank you and praise you for what you're doing in their lives. Because we know that you're right on the horizon. We know that you're coming. We know that the world will never be the same again. But Father, we are able to, we are able to rise to the occasion and we will walk with power. We will walk with your power all the way into eternity. And we give you all praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.